Hello and welcome to Newspeak. Uh, as usual, I'm joined by our senior fellow, Rafe Hadermanku, historian and war commentator, and Amy Gallagher, or Stand Up to Woke, and indeed, of course, the SDP's candidate for mayoralty in London, and uh, the presenter of our latest documentary which is actually going out tomorrow that is uh sunday yep. um amy mm -hmm. what's it about so the title is trans racist and woke how psychology went mad yeah and it's looking at um well it's looking at the kind of history of psychology and psychiatry we're starting off with freud going through today and how it's increasingly become more and more ideological we're so looking at the tavistock looking at um, the encroachment of ideology into psychology. Um, I interview people who are involved with the Tavistock, but I also interview psychotherapists um, and um, Claire Fox, politicians, about, about where we're at now and how psychology is now being weaponized and it's become very political. Um, and where kind of the documentary sort of poses, where, where does that leave us, you know? Uh, okay, uh, this is uh, obviously in our Heresies series. That's at 10 o'clock, yes, is yeah. it? 10 o'clock tomorrow, Heresies, uh, with Amy. Uh, I think it sounds like a, f a great subject. Now, before uh, we talk about the week's quite momentous events in many ways, um, just three dates for diary on the locals front. Um, they're coming up in the next, uh, next two weeks. First of all, uh, this coming Tuesday on the 27th of February in the evening, a social event in Southend. Uh, that's on Tuesday 27th. Then on March the 6th, we have uh, a similar event in London, although actually Amy is our speaker there. So that will be in London. And then f after that on the 11th, we have an evening social in Salisbury. So three dates there. Uh, if you want, if you're near to any of those places, you live in them or around them, you want to join, uh, please do get in touch. Best thing to do is to write to a locals at newcultureforum.org.uk. Okay, so that's Southend, London, and Salisbury. Um, we hope to see you there. Okay, um, this week, or it's been dominated, I think, quite rightly, mm. by what happened in Parliament. I don't know how much we need to recap, but essentially, there are two stories it seems to me going on, and one is about the speaker and the way that. You know, basically, he kind of discarded what is it, a couple of centuries of tradition, uh, if not more, um, and basically allowed a Labour amendment. And then there's a second story, really, which is uh, why this happened, and uh, that's where views may diverge. Um, Rafe, this to me is a sort of seminal moment, seems to me, in our parliamentary democracy. I think it's been a shameful and depressing mm. episode and a demoralizing one and a cowardly one. I mean, because, you know, yes, I mean, people in the, the mainstream media have been too preoccupied with the procedural aspect of this and the, the internecine fighting between the different parties. But, you know, that, that's really for the anoraks to, to talk about to a great degree. The more in fundamental issue for our democracy and for our civilization is the fact that we are now in a state where we have the Speaker of the House of Commons bowing to Islamic extremism at the behest of the leader of the Labour Party, who said if the Labour Party did not have its own motion. The, the issue basically boiled down to the fact mm. that the SNP had a very strict motion which criticised Israel and called for an immediate ceasefire. The Labour Party wanted to have their own motion which didn't criticise Israel but called for a ceasefire and they were worried that Labour MPs who would not be able to vote for the SNP motion would become subject to threats and attacks from Islamic extremists. Now, the degree to which that applies or not, we don't know, but that pressure was applied to the Speaker who caved into that. And just think where we've come today, you know? You, you know, the whole point of Labour opening the doors to mass immigration mm -hmm. under Tony Blair and Peter Mandelson was, as we know from, from Andrew Neither, to rub the right's nose in diversity. Well, Labour's face is now very fully in the mud and being rubbed in that diversity. And of course, they wanted to transform the face of Britain, and they have succeeded in that. Mm -hmm. We are now in a position, you know, he who reaps the wind shall sow the whirlwind, as it says mm -hmm. in Hosea. 
and they have created this situation where far from trying to create a, a future where because you know 80 percent of ethnic minorities vote for labor their idea was they would be able to help secure labor's future you now have labor mps cowering in parliament scared to leave the precincts they have panic buttons in their offices and in their homes and they're getting harassed on the streets this is something that's entirely self-inflicted and the Tories have only put the pedal to the metal and accelerated this whole thing and we've now incorporated into this country the politics of Pakistan intimidation arson death threats assassination mm -hmm. mob protests we must never ever forget who did this to us and we must never forgive them I couldn't agree with you more it's that serious I agree mm -hmm. I totally mm -hmm. agree uh, there is you know a record isn't there in parliament when these sorts of things happen mm. or for like the death of uh, sir david amos or more recently mike freyer standing down as an mp there they have this record don't they of basically making it about something else don't they yeah that they're just wanting to sweep the whole um, Islamic extremism under the carpet yeah. and, and not properly face it. But as you said, we're seeing increasing incidents of this, mm. particularly with um, you know people in the constituencies being bullied, uh, people being intimidated, threats of violence. Uh, and most of us were looking to Westminster Parliament as so thinking, what are you going to do about this? And obviously this issue has now been literally brought to Parliament. Mm. Um, and many of us are wondering, is it, is it that they don't know what to do? Is it that they um, are being prevented from the civil service from doing anything? Is it that they don't think it's an issue? And actually what we've seen this week is that they are scared. They're scared not just of losing the Muslim vote, but they are genuinely scared of their own, for their own safety. Mm -hmm. So what we have now is a situation essentially where we have a soft uh, dictatorship where every level of government, all the way up to from, from local politics, all the way up to parliament, is um, being being influenced by Islamic extremism. So, you know, we, we don't, in this sense, have a proper fully functioning democracy at this point, I think. And it does feel like a, a, a real precedent has been set this week because, you know, most of us are very concerned about this issue um, and, we, we, you know, we don't have the power to fight back. We're, we're looking to Parliament that does have the power and authority to do something about it. And we find out that they're just as scared as we are. So where does that leave ba you know, British citizens? Well, Yes, indeed, as well, just in, I think symbolically very mm -hmm. important, was outside, there was this big kind of, there was a big demonstration going on, although actually don't confuse, a lot of this intim intimidation is very local and, it, and it's, it's mm. people's houses, that's the whole point, yes. isn't it? And their constituency offices, but last night, you know, there was a, uh, this um, uh, projection onto Big Ben, as we would call it, um, of from the river to the sea, which is you know, a genocidal chant. And it went right up, didn't it? It was just projected onto the tower and uh, the police allowed it. Um, now, even if you forget about hate speech and if you forget all of these things, um, it's always been in our law that incitement to violence or murder has always mm. been one of the restrictions on free speech. You know? mm. But this was allowed. This, so in other words, you have this inside, this cowardice, and then you also have the basically the police doing nothing. Worse than doing nothing, they were actually in a sense complicit because they actually issued a statement which went out on Twitter and they said we are aware of that the statement from the river to the sea can have extremist or genocidal sort of references but in this but in some contexts it's acceptable mm. and this was not a criminal act and you think why do you always try to find a loophole? Why are you always you know appeasing or in some way making it permissible for this stuff to go on, whether it be calling for jihad on the streets or where it be this. But yet anyone who just simply misgenders somebody or retweets something, they get the full force of the law. And it's, it's because the uh, Muslim extremists see this complete lack of will on behalf of the police that they feel emboldened. And each time they inch a little bit further and become a little bit more extreme. Now we have this on, uh, on, on, the, on the Elizabeth Tower, as you were saying. So yeah, this is all about the police actually aiding and abetting Islamic extremism by failing to do their duty. Now, they actually do have powers already existing. There's a task force called Defend Democracy, which exists 
to help MPs across the country that I mean, to, to break up protests outside houses and outside MPs offices they haven't just implemented and they haven't properly done that now today James Cleverly the Home Office Sec Sec Secretary of State has said that they're going to be given further powers to help to um, dismantle protests outside of homes and constituency offices um, but they're also now is, is the, the question about Parliament because of course our MPs aren't very safe you know it's not like an American senator or congressman who has yeah. security detail and just and now of course people don't can't drive into the city so they have to take public transport so there are serious issues at play here and I don't see any real attempt being made to actually tackle this I think uh, you know you say why are you trying to find a loophole about the police you say that why do you think they are well, I think it's part of a broader cultural issue that we've been become much more accustomed to these type of slogans and, and, and the police being politicised and London itself being politicised. I mean, with the Black Lives Matter protests, we were seeing Black Lives Matter written on churches, in shops, in fireworks. And you can say, OK, well, it's, it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with the phrase Black Lives Matter, but we know there were sinister um, you know, elements to it. It was a Marxist organisation. It had elements of critical race theory in it. Um, and we've just gotten used to slogans and, and, and political activism everywhere in London. So when you have something like this, which is a, a political slogan, but is, is very you know, anti-Semitic and, and as you say, genocidal, it's very, extremely sinister. People just shrug, you know, because we've been so we've, we've just sort of we no longer take London seriously as a, as a city, I don't think. And we no longer take you. I think people just turn so demoralized that something w which should have us up in arms, like this this message on Big Ben, people just think, well, we've seen so much of this with Just Stop Oil and, and all sorts of things, you know, interfering with traffic and the police not doing anything, that I think people have just given up hope on the, the police completely at this point. And the police, uh, I, don't, I think they've completely lost their confidence and they don't know what, what their job is anymore. I, I think say, saying that the police have lost their confidence, uh, I can see what you mean. Mm. Um, I don't know whether it's actually that. I think that they it, people have underestimated quite how much they've been taken over by this ideology. It's not just the top brass. It's not. It's not. It's not. I'm sorry. I, it is also the training they've received. You know, we've had enough instances of this, haven't we, on these demonstrations. One thing that struck me about the Big Ben thing before leaving that as, as well is that one thing that was completely missing is that, aside from the actual law. It didn't occur to anyone in that, you know, they, they, they're putting out these incredibly sort of, you know, uh, pompous statements at the moment, aren't mm. they, Matt? But it never occurred to one to say, we fully recognise this is one of our greatest, if not our most recognisable building. Yeah. You know, there's no sense whatsoever mm. of the outrage. It's almost like, oh, well, you know, it's actually possibly in this situation, it's not unlawful and all of that. Mm. Even on that level, we understand how people might feel this is a blah blah blah. Nothing. I, I don't think it occurs to them anymore. Um, and the irony there, of course, is that the police now are so focused and obsessed by offence. Mm. Everything is offensive. The microaggressions and the raising of an eyebrow by a teacher in class. Mm. And yet the nation as a whole is offended when genocidal statements are projected onto the very symbol of our democracy, onto the, mother, the very mother of parliaments. Yet that ultimate offence is seemingly unimportant to the police. I think actually, though, isn't it? I mean, I know we talk about this a lot, but I still think, I don't know how many people in the country actually still know, even after this amount of time, know what this slogan means. Yes, yeah. You know, I mean, do you remember there was a sur survey out to show that people didn't know what the word woke meant? Mm. Uh, when you are, like we are moving in political world a lot, you know, you sort of think, how can you not know? But I'm wondering whether, pe how serious people, do they still think this is a far away thing? Yeah, and I think the, the mainstream media's representation of this issue has been terrible. I mean, there's a lot of em emphasis on the, the intricate policies of the mm. Speaker and of Labour, and there wasn't much emphasis on the real intimidation that was happening. Um, we saw on Question Time, you know, a real emphasis on, on the, the 
Middle Eastern you know, conflict and what to do about it. Not much emphasis on on you know the intimidation of MPs that's mm -hmm. happening here, and and there's still an idea that you know this this is a real issue that we should all be thinking about in this country. Which for most of us, you know, we're thinking why why is this getting so much attention yeah. when it's got nothing to do with us? Mm -hmm. So I think yeah, there is there is definitely kind of echo chambers going on with regards to this issue where people are just totally on a completely different page. You know, actually, what happened at the same time last night. Uh, up in Rochdale where there's a by-election going on, a campaign going on, um, the guy who is standing for reform, um, Simon Danzig, I mm. think his name is, uh, was actually uh, barred from talking in a meeting by George Galloway's people, it seems. Um, did you hear about this? It was no. uh, Yes, it was just, it was last night. It, it's with amazing timing actually and um, the fact that they felt so empowered that they could actually do this he's not a particularly controversial character i don't think he's you know it's not the point well, anyway a former northern labor mp yeah. yes indeed yes exactly anyway but they have they sort of managed this of uh, footage of this on twitter of him being barred it's all of a piece i mean the seriousness of this can't be overstated um, and I want, you know, okay, so people say, what are you going to do about it or whatever? But first of all, we have to accept, do we not, that give it a, about a week, give it a few days, and this will all start to fade away. And basically, they will make sure it fades away. Mm. People have just got to wise up, haven't they? I mean, they really have got to wake up. I mean, this is for our democracy. This is mm. just uh, quite incredibly and important. You, yeah, and you do wonder what will have to happen for people to wake up. I mean, you know, that we've had so many incidents of, of terrorism, of violence, of murder, of people being threatened. You do sort of start to wonder what does, would it take for people to really, you know, take this issue properly seriously? Mm. I mean, I, I don't know anymore. It, it's difficult to say when, when people are really going to sort of be very concerned about this issue. I mean, Suella Braverman's speaking out, but it's still seems very difficult to speak out on this issue and obviously you know Labour are likely to get in and what does that say if we've got you know Keir Starmer who I think should resign over this this issue I think it's such yes, a big uh, issue great, actually terrible. the yeah. fact that he's likely to go on to be our leader when he clearly mm. can't you know he's incapable of being leader he's he, you know um, and we'll, we'll bring in Islamophobia laws and, and all sorts of things just you know you just you just it's terrifying actually yes. well, let's just, yeah let's be clear here Keir Starmer and the Labour Party are in hock to Islamism, mm. right? They are basically, there is a mafia behind the scenes here dictating what can and cannot be done when it comes to certain subjects and certain issues. And it's going to become more acute when Labour gets into power because they've lost so much uh, trust amongst the Muslim population for being on Israel's side mm. that they're going to have to make huge concessions to, mm. to, to Muslim extremists in order to secure their vote in the future, especially for council elections and so forth, because there's a complete stranglehold over many councils mm. by, by, by the Labour Muslim vote there. So things are only going to get worse, unfortunately, I dare say, under Labour. And you, you ain't seen nothing yet, unfortunately. And you know, Amy's quite right. You know, what would it take? You've had the mass scale industrial rape of young girls. You've had 7-7. Seven, seven. You've had terrorist attacks. You've had um, the, the stuff happening on bridges in London. You've had a, a MP assassinated. I don't really know what more it could take for this to actually trigger people to st stand up and say no more. Also, uh, you know, we had um, the, the Manchester Ariana, Ariana Grande bomb. Yes where in fact everyone sang, stood up and sang don't look back in anger and you sort of thought they're murdering your daughters mm. when is it going to be enough you know when or what will it be enough and in fact yes you should be angry and look back in anger you know I don't want to mm. sort of hear this sort of thing I, I, I think that it's uh, this growth of sectarianism um, which is what this is what would the next stage be I would have thought possibly unofficial legal control of certain cities I mean I'm just I'm just hypothesizing about this but basically these things do not have to be officially recognized do they I mean they, that comes a lot later but you can see how some of our cities maybe they start you know Sharia law for example mm -hmm. they say well why can't we have Sharia law? we're 90% Muslim here mm -hmm. we want to have Sharia law 
or the growth of a new Muslim political party, even if it's well, that's official. That's sort of happening yeah. in this yeah. nation. It's, it's mm. The Muslim vote, I think mm. it's called. You know, and um, I think that you know this is these. You say we shouldn't. F they should never be Ill forgiven. Never be. And I couldn't agree more. You know, it seems to me that uh, this is treacherous. Actually, it is. Mm. I mean, it's the great. It, it's the greatest act of harm ever committed mm. on the British people in in two thousand years. It's far more consequential than than Brexit and the mm. EU. Mm. Um, yet we we were given a vote on that. The British people were never asked about any of this, mm. and in fact, just the opposite. They voted in every government to do just mm. the opposite, and had that vote betrayed. And this is, you know, this is far more damaging to Britain than the cost of fighting the Second World War. Mm. And uh, I think the people who have willingly allowed in a fifth column into this country, who are actively undermining this nation and its institutions, mm. and actually seek to overthrow our established systems and structures. They sh absolutely should be tried, and, you know, and, and convicted for, for a, if, for treason. I, I would imagine, or something along those lines, because it is that significant. I mean, if that's not treason, the death of your own country. I don't know what is. Yes, exactly. Uh, you know, it's uh, it, it is it is an extraordinary time at the moment. No question. It's also been. We've also, uh, it, in a tangential way, the royal family have got involved, haven't they, with Prince William, mm -hmm. um, talking about talking about the war, the Israeli-Gaza war this week, um, and, uh, you know, uh, it quite, it seemed to me quite unprecedented was, it was a statement he put out saying that essentially we all want the fighting to end. Well, I mean, what did you make, I mean, you're a royal commentator, what did you make of it? Right, in the sense that it just sort of like I, I could at the end of it, he said, um, "I, I refuse to give up my dream or something of peace." And I sort of thought, I don't care what you think, actually, you know. Well, we shouldn't know what what, what anyone in the yes, royal exactly. family thinks. So that's the whole purpose of the monarchy is is that once you take an opinion, you immediately divide the nation on, on any issue, and there, and that's that was the Her Majesty's you know mantra was essentially never to do anything mm. like that. Now, of course. Princes of Wales, as we know from when Prince Charles was Prince of Wales and Prince William, they have more leeway to, to be more, uh, to, to, to have a more sort of uh, opinionated um, life. But at the same time, this statement makes it a precedent. So if he doesn't now make a, a similar statement about any other conflict that happens, mm -hmm. people will say, well, well why not? So now there's a bit, he must do that, otherwise somehow this is a unique situation. Because why didn't he comment about Yemen, for example? Why hasn't he commented about the, the fighting in Syria, for example, or, mm. or any of those, of those issues? So it does set a, a dangerous precedent. It comes from a good place, right? The king, you know, Prince of Wales is very compassionate. And, you know, when he made that statement, he made a point of the fact he went and met with humanitarian aid workers, as his father had done a couple of months previously. But then also the, the same week he went to visit a synagogue mm -hmm. and discuss uh, the, the global rise of anti-Semitism. And in this statement, he, all he said was that fighting should end as soon as possible, not calling for a ceasefire, mm -hmm. but say hope he hopes it would. So it was all done very diplomatically and he's got good advisors around him. Yet I think this was definitely a mistake. And I think uh, my own personal view is that I think he overruled his advisors opinions on this. Really? Mm. What because he, he, just hired, he just hired a new private secretary who was uh, um, uh, uh, very involved in peacekeeping with Paddy Ashdown when he was UN High Representative to Bosnia and Herzegovina, was a former advisor to the chief of, of MI6. Yeah. So someone like that wouldn't have advised for him to, to make this sort of a statement. What yeah, I mean, I was very surprised by it. I thought it was quite out of character for William. And I was actually thinking the opposite, that maybe somebody had advised him to do this and he'd get, been given bad advice because it seemed, like I said, un, uh, it seemed something more like Prince Harry would do rather than mm, Prince William. Mm. Um, and, you know, g yeah, exactly, getting, getting involved in, in, in something that political, something that's happening in the Middle East as well. That's not, it's not to do with this country. You think, why is he wading in on this? And the last two paragraphs were... I've just thought they were, it sounded, bits of it sounded like something a Miss World contestant would say. He yeah. wants permanent peace, world peace. You'd think, oh, for goodness yeah. sake, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then he said, and then he said, he used the phrase darkest hour, sort of invoking Churchill. 
within the context of you know a, a speech a patriotic speech about defending this country and actually using it in relation to a Middle Eastern war and as Rafe said you know why why isn't he you know why isn't he speaking about anti-semitism in his statement or why isn't he speaking about other things that are happening in this country he's supposed to be the king of England not the king of the Middle East and actually you know why isn't he commenting on other things mm. so it's it's really concerning and it's um, yeah like I said very out of character for William and um, not a good not a good sign actually no. it's sort of a, it's, I found it sort of peevish mm. you know that, uh, I was just saying it's just a personal thing I sort of thought it's peevish but I just wonder actually whether the, the Queen was uh, obviously uh, the total opposite of that I wonder whether it's because this is just bring it out there that a constitutional monarchy works better with women like the Queen but then when you have men who've got any kind of opinion they will find it very hard if, well, you, if you can imagine Philip if, he, if the world had been different how could he Prince Philip well, the, the, the Queen's reign was was exceptional for being the only monarch who didn't really interfere yeah, in politics yeah. to the point all the passivity. others have mm -hmm. to the point of passivity and you know people like David Starkey have have criticized her late majesty for her possibility on, on certain issues but certainly you know other monarchs you know George V very involved in Irish home rule and con brought people there to convene the summit under his own accord um, Edward VII also but they all did things behind the scenes this is a public statement mm. which is a very different sort of thing so mm. I personally wouldn't mind if monarchs behind the scenes were acting in some capacity and using their right to uh, to to inform and to warn um, but I think this is a, this was a step too far, and I hope to not to see much more of it. Of course, he's very keen to, to have a greater international profile as he mm -hmm. uh, in the run up to becoming king. Eventually, he went uh, four years ago. He went to the Middle East, and he he met with uh, Netanyahu, and he met with Mahmoud Abbas, the um, president of the peer of, of the Palestinian uh, Authority as well. So I think, and of course, his you know his great grandmother is buried there, Princess Alice, a righteous Gentile. Um, so there's very much a personal connection and, I, and his father has been involved for decades in interfaith dialogue and building bridges in the area so I think he's very much influenced by all of that. Speaking of the Queen actually uh, brings us nicely on to something else which we had said this week which I think is probably an issue you're going to have to talk about at one point on your <laughs> campaign if you haven't already mm. is that unofficially it was always thought that the fourth plinth, which is that empty plinth in Trafalgar Square, uh, was sort of reserved statue of the Queen, um, but that in the meantime uh, it was going to be filled with this uh, ever rotating group of uh, modern artists, what have you. They were all unveiled this week, six of them, and I mean, you know, it's almost like they're taking the piss. I'm sorry, but I mean, it's essentially, you know. Uh, the, the whole, th all the themes are pretty much as you would imagine, aren't they? Mm. But one, the one picture I saw, which I think we're going to, we can show you here, is of a, an Indian ice cream van. Um, what if they talk, if they asked you about the plinth, you know, when you do mm. one of your hustings in mm. London, what, what's your view on it? Then? What would you say? Oh, I think it should be. Well, the thing is with it that it's become so synonymous with this kind of lunacy and I identity politics that you almost well, I mean, I do want the Queen statue to be there, but you almost think it's actually insulting for her to be on this plinth now that's so, so much associated with, with terrible contemporary art. Um, I think a lot of you know, the argument in favour of this modern art is that, you know, we want to promote, you know, current artists and London is a, a city of creativity, which is true. You know, London has, um, even in the last century, produced artists like Francis Bacon, Lucian Freud, it has a history of, I mean, Alexander McQueen, the fashion designer, was from Lewisham, John Galliano for Dior was from Peckham, David Bowie was from Bromley. So, you know, London is a huge city for creativity and fashion and the arts. But the, you know, the thing about all those aforementioned artists is that they were innovative and they w did have a degree of talent. But the art that's put on this fourth plinth d doesn't demonstrate any of that. It doesn't even demonstrate um, you know, any, any kind of rebelliousness because it's actually extremely conformist. Mm. It's conforming mm. to the identitarian 
orthodoxy of the day. Um, it's completely in line with what Sadiq Khan would promote. It's all about you know trans or, or, or ethnic minorities, and it's not even doing. It's not even promoting those issues in, in an interesting way. They're usually often just one-liners. They look hideous, and they cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. Yeah. So I really do think um, it should be. You know, we we need to get rid of it as soon as possible, actually, and put the Queen there now so that we can forget about the last <laughs> ten or fifteen years of all these nonsense things that have been on there and just get her on there as soon as possible. That ah, would be my well you see, this inter <laughs> the interesting thing about that, the, 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 the idea of the Queen on the, is that some people actually think it's not enough for her. Mm. Oh, yeah. And that in fact, actually, given, you know, how she became the Queen, didn't she, this massive figure in the past, last 10 years of her life, mm. you know, that in fact there should be something along the lines of the Albert Memorial. Well, that's what I've been saying. You know, we have a Victoria Memorial, we have an Albert Memorial, uh, Her yeah. Majesty certainly deserves to have her own significant memorial yeah. uh, in Hyde Park or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some people said at the other end of the Mall from the Victoria Memorial to the right of when you go into Horse Guards Parade. Well, I think that's too small, but definitely. I mean, look, Queen Victoria has 10 statues in London. I think we can easily have two of the Queen, one mm -hmm. on the fourth blinth, just because to make a point about putting it there, not to mm -hmm. give in to these people, and then a major one elsewhere, maybe on Royal Park land or something or something along those lines. When the fourth plinth was first announced in 1999, I was actually in favor of it because I knew that eventually the queen would go there and I thought this would be a fun way to bring art to the public. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Ken Livingston and, uh, and, and, and uh, Boris Johnson too, actually, mm -hmm. and Sadiq Khan have uh, allowed that plinth to be captured and become a platform for divisive mm -hmm. identity politics, as Amy was saying. And you're quite right. These people are not selected. The, 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 the artists aren't selected for their merit. Mm -hmm. They're selected exclusively for their identity identity and for their message and there's no escaping the message and you know this came in the same week or a few days after Khan was renaming overground lines you know so you can mm. you can never escape the messaging he's using every tool at his disposal to enforce his new cultural orthodoxy of new heroes new identity new messaging it's you know it's it's you know as I said before it's going from net zero to year zero mm. our, our mayor now this six the six sh artists shortlisted for this fourth plinth five of them are ethnic minorities and the sixth is a white woman so not a single white male now britain is 81 percent white 74.5 percent white british you would think they'd be able to find some proper artist to truly represent the nation instead of this you mentioned the ice cream ice cream van that was to commemorate the indian community in liverpool so what on earth is it doing in london it has nothing to do another one is this giant sweet potato celebrating peru's vegetables looks like a giant sheep dropping to me but you know mm. that's that's an, another thing that's being put up there another one is of a metropolitan woman of color i mean what is the purpose of that the current the current statue on the fourth plinth commemorates a man who held a, a preacher who held a service underneath a decapitated head of a, of a british plantation of a person who'd been you know, this is the sort of world we live in now where it, it's just everything is done to undermine Britain and British culture and nothing is done to actually celebrate it. The, uh, the thing is, you know, when it comes to London now, uh, you've got a real problem, haven't you? Because essentially, uh, one, this is the main, this is the, the, the whole crux of the matter. At one point, you could have made those points, you know, uh, and you still could indeed, but you're no longer talking to a crowd that actually would go along with you and feel it's being imposed on them because the population itself has grown so different over the past what 20 years that in fact you know they're far more well if they are not indifferent to it they're far more open to it you know and they and also there's it the point is really it's the banality mm. of it isn't it self-expression usually ends up being but now, I mean, have you liked anything that's been on there? Can you think back? I can go right back to Alison Lapper Pregnant. Do you remember that one? Mm. I mean, um, do, you, do you like any of the ones? That, well, I, I've got one I quite liked. Not, no, not really. And the, apparently this next one that they're going to, I mean, Sadiq Khan wants to extend it further. He wants to keep it going. So we're going to have a few more before we get the Statue of the Queen, if we do get the Statue of the Queen. But then the next one, it, it looks terrible. It, it's the fa faces of transgender sex workers kind of masks of their faces so did you. The, the just it look they look like kind of a, a, like an egg car or something it looks terrible and the point is that they're going to wash away in the rain to make some kind of statement about um, how they're treated by society so it's just going to look like a, a, an absolute mess mm. um, it's got no there's no um, 
consideration of beauty or, as you say, talent or meritocracy, even if they were issues to do with identity, but they were done well, you would mm. at least think, well, it, it at least shows some merit, mm. but it doesn't even show that. Mm. So you don't, you get the worst of all worlds, really. I reckon that the only way to get around these sort of things in the future uh, is, I mean, a lot of people hate the idea of popular votes. Don't yes. forget, although these are going to be voted on, these six, mm. they are all chosen for you to vote on. Exactly, yeah. Whereas, in fact, it's strangely enough, in a t at a time when we did not have universal suffrage, these things, like I think it's General Napier, I think is, is in, the, in yeah. the square, they were done by public subscription. Yeah. And mostly pro what we call private soldiers, you know, Scottish. And um, I think that... You know, you've got to actually open it up to people. Who would you like to see? But not just London. That's the only way around this. Open it up to the country. Yes. It is Trafalgar Square after oh, all. This would definitely be a British thing. London is the capital yeah. of Britain. It yeah. may not mm -hmm. seem like it at times, but it still is. And, yeah. we, and we forget that, you know, yeah. quite often when you have these discussions. It's very important. Mm -hmm. But it's also, you know, the committees that the, the fourth plinth commissioning group, mm -hmm. they're the ones, you know, because Khan doesn't choose the artwork. It's this commissioning mm -hmm. group. And it includes people like John Snow, the Channel 4 broadcaster, you know. This was the man who said that. That, you know, he had never seen so many white people when there was a Brexit rally in, in, in Whitehall. The same person who goes to Glastonbury every year, which is 10 times larger and 99.9% .9 white and middle class. That's the type of person who actually loathes British people who is deciding these artworks. Yeah, yeah. It is, uh, it is, it's kind of boring. I, the one I, I was seeing, I, I quite liked one, it was actually the ship in the bottle. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which ended up down at Greenwich, actually, because it is a man, it was rather nice. I mean, it was sort of a, a little bit gimmicky, but it was sort of rather mm. nice. But otherwise, it, as you say, they, it is meant to be a standing rebuke, isn't it, to what else is in the square? Mm. Isn't that what it is? Yeah, it's supposed to be kind of dissident art, but of course it's not at all. The, no. You know, people vote on, you get, the vote that happens is you get the choice of, you know, four to five or different issues are all about identity politics. Mm, so it's mm. all com completely conformist. As you say, if there was a vote, a nationwide vote, you could potentially get some very interesting yeah, dissident yeah. art that could yeah. be interesting and people might really back something that was, you know, that had something of worth and of merit. Um, but at the moment, it, it, it's just the complete opposite of what art should do or, or modern art should do in that it is, it's totally in line with the, the orthodoxy. I think just dissident art now would mean you need to have a statue of Margaret Thatcher or, exactly, the, or yes, Britannia yes, standing yes, there with exactly, a flag. I think exactly. that, Actually, that's the point. If you open it up, who do you think, if there was a big kind of competition, because mm. a lot of people, they t I can understand, they sort of think, oh, God, public taste changes so quick. If you had made this question about this uh, statue and say that the year 2000, solidly it would have been one of Diana. Mm. Right, and and basically it might not be now. Who would you like to see? Forget about the Queen. I've got. Who would you like to see on mm. the fourth plit if it were going to be a s s square, you know, solid statue? Somebody, not a theme or a concept. It's a good question. Have a think. Yeah, maybe. What do you think? Go on. Well, as I would like to see Margaret Thatcher. Mm. Um, she should be in Parliament Square, yeah. and that was under the jurisdiction of Westminster Council, mm. and Westminster Council refused to have a statue of the first female Prime Minister. Mm. I think that's outrageous. In the end, they have some suffragette there now. I forget, Emily yeah. Davidson or something, or Millicent's Millicent. Forces. Um, was that her name? Yes, <laughs> yeah, all right. Yes. Listen, you but I mean, yes. you know, the yes. fact that, you know, this a giant figure like Thatcher, you know, then that yeah. doesn't have a statue there. You've got Churchill there, you've got, you know, you've got uh, Gandhi there, for heaven's sake, Nelson Mandela. You haven't got Gandhi, have you? No, you've got Nelson Mandela there, you've got Abraham Lincoln who's there. You've got, you Jan, got yeah, and you've got Jan, got Jan, Jan Smuts is there from South Africa yeah, yeah, as well, yeah, you yeah, know. Exactly. That, the ice skating prime minister, as he's called for that statue. <laughs> uh, so, so as he's not there, I think it would be nice to have her on the fourth plinth, raised high enough so that she can't be attacked. <laughs> oh, Thatcher. Yes, actually, the, the statue they did of Thatcher that's now in Grantham, I believe, the one that is actually a pretty good statue. And I mean, you can see it standing in Parliament Square, certainly. Mm. It's, you know, she's in her robes of, of being that's Baroness right. Thatcher. Thatcher. Uh, it's actually quite good. Um, I would like, if you come up with well, one yet, you you've had have enough some, time. I was thinking you could have someone like a Londoner, like, I don't know, like Charlie Chaplin or someone, a famous artist. He was artist. in Leicester Square. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, or maybe David Bowie or some I don't know, someone that's a Londoner that most people like that isn't too divisive. I don't know. Yeah. I've got someone who's become divisive, yes. but in fact would make a real point. William Wilberforce. Oh yes, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a very good one. William Wilberforce. Yeah. 
campaigned against slavery. Can you imagine how they would try and get yeah. around that white savior, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. But I think it would be a good one. And also he'd be appropriately in 18th century garb, wouldn't he? Mm -hmm. uh, 19th, 19th century garb, I mm -hmm. um, Before we leave, um, just a small thing. I don't know if you've looked at uh, Google's AI project, actually, uh, artificial intelligence. It's called Gemini. But it's hit the, uh, well, at least social media, if not the new. Oh, yes, actually, it's been in some papers. Um, how they interpret, uh, like, English people or historical uh, Americans um, is quite something, isn't it, Amy? Yeah, so it, it seems that when you type in certain uh, figures, yeah. you g get people of, uh, well, non-white people, non -white essentially, people. Wh which you would not associate with the particular historical era that you're yes. looking at or the country or the continent. Um, I mean, this isn't new. I mean, Douglas Murray's actually spoken about this. So in his, in his book, The Madness of Crowds, he spoke about how if you Google sort of a couple, in, if you put the into Google, yeah. you will always get mixed race couples. And yeah. if you want a, a just a white couple, you have to specify that. So it's already telling you that, you know, you're, you should be looking, you know, you shouldn't be looking at all white couples and so on. But this, this AI issue now takes it to the whole next level. Um, and it's really concerning. I mean, it's like something, it's like a combination of Brave New World and 1984. It's really dystopian that mm. history is being changed um, and how we're supposed to view things is totally being changed through technology. And of course, there is always a human, um, at, you know, at the end of or end of all of this What's stuff. And that's the point. It's not yeah. just technology. It's, it's the people behind it that are influencing this. And we know that Silicon Valley and tech organizations are extremely left leaning. We saw that with Twitter, but we're now seeing it with this AI. Haven't they suspended it or something? Right? They've pulled it down. I mean, Elon Musk is the one who's basically uh, made this into a huge global story by, by, by promoting the, the journalist who found out all of this stuff. I mean, and the stuff here was quite ludicrous. I mean, you would search for a, a show me picture of the Pope and you have an Asian Indian woman dressed up as the Pope. I mean, you know, like if you're going to find an A demographic that is the least likely to ever to become Pope, it would be an Indian woman, I, yeah. I suspect. Another one was to, to show us a 1943 German soldier, and then you'd have a Chinese or a black person in a Nazi uniform. You, you, you ask them to do, show us, show us a, a Viking, and you have someone who looked like they're from the cast of Wakanda, you know, and it's someone who looked like it was Ngozi Fulani in historical outfit. So, I mean, this whole thing is actually completely ludicrous but also completely deliberate because it requires mm. coding people have to manually code this sort of stuff in there mm. and it's very sinister because it's the eradication of white people but it's not just the eradication of white people by some new startup company this is by google mm. and google mm. basically controls your entire online existence mm. you, you probably use chrome to, as a web browser you use google as a search engine um, it's influent, you use YouTube, you use all of these things that are owned by Google, your phone maybe is an Android, so it actually has more knowledge about the world than any other organization, and it has more influence over our perception of reality. I mean, you know, Elon Musk also, for example, typed into, into Google search, censorship is, and you would have thought it would, you know, you get the prompts, you mm -hmm. thought it would say censorship is bad, or censorship is a threat to free speech, no, the prompts were censorship is important, and censorship is important for social media. Those are the prompts now that you, you get. So this is very sinister and it's not actually quite the laugh that people think it is because it goes mm. fundamentally to the actual essence of, of our civilization and our knowledge of our past and, and it's setting the agenda for the future and it's changing minds. Mm. Also, it's with the kind of death of, uh, oh, with the, or should I say with the advent of my own truth, um, mm. it's all part of that really that essentially how do you know how do you know he wasn't black? How do you know this has all been, this is a whitewashing of history? You know, it's the same thing. It's not just AI, is it? As you say, I remember quite a long time ago, if you just put into Google images, isn't it? I mean, mm. uh, there was a point at which you show me English people or something and then up would come. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been it's been happening for a long time. This kind of rewriting of history, yeah. but with as technology develops, it's it's kind of harder and harder to discern. Yeah. You know, and we've got a whole younger generation who won't know that you know this is happening, and we'll just take it as read what they see. Yes, exactly. So, so it's it's exactly. you know it's yeah. very really concerning. I mean, one of the reasons they did this, of course, they say in their defence is that. Um, well, we, we represent the world, and so the world, obviously, and white people are a minority, we're trying to represent that. But what was very interesting was the guy who's in charge of Google AI said, you know, we want images to reflect the world. So that, you know, a, a man walking a dog is universal, a person walking a dog is universal. 
but it's not no, because it's not. dogs are very much a West walking a dog is a Western thing, and the fact that that's his mindset when dogs aren't treated in the same way elsewhere in the world shows you actually the flaw at the heart of all of this. It's, yes. it's a very globalist attitude, isn't it? Like there is this universal kind of person when, when there isn't. We have different cultures and different countries where things are done very differently, but they don't. They don't. They want to kind of push that out. It's kind of nowhere people versus anywhere people. You know that. that there are, you know, there, there is no distinct culture anymore. It's got to be something that's completely unifying, which is a myth that there isn't, it doesn't exist. It should be said about this uh, particular, the, there's a woman who is behind, or, you know, the top poncho, if you like, um, at uh, Google AI Gemini. Her name is Jen Janai, uh, appropriately enough. And uh, she's been quite clear, I mean, there have been videos of her speaking at various presentations. She's quite, uh, you know, open white privilege she's outrageous i you know this is too white this company etc so well, of course you know the power that these people have mm -hmm. is extraordinary anyway um on that note um amy so tomorrow yes. right tomorrow heresies and what is the title um trans racist and woke how psychology went mad 10 o'clock tomorrow uh for that um Look forward to it very much. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much, Rafe. Thanks for having me. And uh, we shall see you next time. Have a good week, won't you, in the meantime. Bye. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.